everybody. Good morning. Come on in and find, find a seat. Have a seat. Make yourself at home. So glad that y'all remembered to spring forward today. Al, I'm glad y'all remembered to uh, spring forward. Uh, I remember one year, uh, we had a couple people come in into my sermon. Uh, they had forgotten. So I'm glad y'all remembered. Um, it was a little rough this morning getting up an hour early, but uh, glad you're here. Uh, for those visiting with us, my name is Jared. I'm the pastor here. I'd love to know you. Uh, you'll find a yellow card in your bulletin. Fill that out. Come in the offering plate. If you desire membership or baptism, you can fill this out and bring it forward here. Uh, the pastor and the will say hello to each other. We'll take care of that then. Uh, also, I have a couple of announcements for you this morning. The first, in your bulletin, you'll see this little uh, handout. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt here on March 31st. It will be free. This is a, for the community and for y'all. And so I want to invite you to invite all your friends, all your neighbors, to come out to the Easter egg hunt on the 31st from 10 to 1. But on this sheet, you will see what we need as far as donations. Uh, egg fillers, juice, pastries, decorations, prizes. And then you'll see what we need volunteers for, IDA, things like that. If you're interested in helping, please see Julie Arthur, who's standing back here by the stairs. Julie is our children's uh, director. Please see Julie if you're interested in helping or if you have questions. But please take this home with you. Put it on your refrigerator so you don't forget. We need help with this. Uh, we did this two years ago, and it was a great uh, success. And so we expect a great turnout this year, so we need your help. The second announcement is this. Uh, the Boy Scouts are selling pine straw. And delivery is next Saturday. Is that what you said, Jim? Next Saturday. Uh, Jim Brady is the point person on this. You have details that you want to share? Uh, next Saturday, uh, we're all available to pick up at the supplier delivery for your home. Um, the deadline's coming up pretty soon. Monday or Tuesday, we need to know if the pine service will be a fall. All right. Uh, this is a great way to get uh, pine straw. It doesn't cost much, but I'm helping the Boy Scouts out. So I would encourage you to please see Jim before you leave today. Uh, there are a bunch of announcements in your bulletin new this week. Uh, like a work day at church and things like that. Please read this uh, either during worship day at some point or when you get home. But please read over your bulletin. See what's happening in the coming week. See how you can get involved here at Ball Ground at Methodist Church. Again, my name is Jared. We're so happy you're here this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to come into your house. We thank you, Lord, that, that we, can, we can be in your presence. Lord, my prayer is that we would not squander the opportunity that we have right now. The opportunity to, to, to just feel you. The opportunity to hear your, your words this morning. So Lord, I just pray that we would just lay out all of the distractions, all the other stuff going on in our lives, and we would just focus in this hour on you. That we would be an active participant in this worship hour. That we would, we would not focus on those around us, but we would focus on you on the cross and what you've done for us. That, that, that would just pour, pour out of us in, in our singing and in our praying and in, in our worshiping, Heavenly Father. Just be with us in this hour. We pray for the Holy Spirit to move. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and sing with us this morning. Come on.
Heavenly Father, let, let that be our prayer this morning. Let each of our prayers this morning be, come Holy Spirit. Move in this place. Move in my hearts. I'm at your mercy. I'm at your mercy. That means I, I give it all up. I, I, I lay it all down. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not here anymore for myself. I'm not here anymore because I need to check this off the weekly things to do list. I'm here because I need a movement of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you know that, that, that some of us this week are just really struggling. That, that, that life is just not going the way we need it to go. Our, our, our spouse is just not, not loving us the way we think they should love us. Our spouse isn't doing what we think they should be doing. Our children are, are, are making us want to pull our hair out. Our job is beating us down. The doctor called with bad news. Whatever it is, Lord, we need a movement of the Holy Spirit today in our hearts. We need a movement of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit today, Lord, to, to, to empower us to, to carry on. We need a movement of the Holy Spirit today, Lord, so that we can forgive ourselves and forgive those around us. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and move in this place today, at this hour. Right now. We need your grace. We're at your mercy. Lord, I just, I don't want to squander this opportunity. Later on in the service, we'll have a time of, of, of repentance and a time of asking for forgiveness. But Lord, I don't want those here this morning uh, that need to, to do that, to, to have to wait. So if there are those here today that just, they need to repent right now, let them do that to you, Lord. Let them ask for your forgiveness right now. Lord, my prayer is that as we are forgiven, that we would go and forgive. That we would share the gospel of forgiveness. As I mentioned, there are those here this morning who are, who are struggling with hardships and problems. Let me pray your blessing upon them. I pray your protection upon them. For those that are, are suffering across this country with being out of work, not being able to pay the bills, Lord, I pray that you would provide for them exactly what they need to make it through another week. And that they would understand that it comes from you. For our men and women who are serving overseas trying to protect this great nation, I pray your protection upon them today. That I, pr I pray for that there would be a movement of the Holy Spirit in Afghanistan and Iraq today. That I know that we are not there to spread Christianity, but Lord, I, I pray that we would be there to, pr to spread Christianity. That through our, through our men and women who are serving, that, that Christ would be shown in the Middle East. And there be a revival. Lord, I pray for the church in Venezuela. I pray for the Christians in Africa. Lord, protect them all. And with that in our minds, Lord, let us understand that we have an opportunity that so many Christians do not have this morning. So many Christians are afraid to go to church because they will be killed. But Lord, we are able to walk in here. And no one is throwing rocks at us. No one is trying to shoot us. We can walk in here. And too many times, Lord, we just take it for granted. Well, not today. Not today, Heavenly Father. Come to me. We are at your mercy. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Maybe see you. Kids, I'm going to go ahead and just finish the Children's Church. We just don't have time today. I apologize. But I know you all enjoy Children's Church more. And as the kids return, I ask the ushers to come on down. As we continue our worshiping through our giving. Um, I like to give you good news uh, as often as I possibly can. And uh, I mentioned this to the band while we were praying for worship today. The past couple of weeks... 
I have been able to, to talk to several people in this church. And they've been able to tell me how God is moving in their lives and in their families. And, I, and I'm not talking about, you know, what we think are minor things. I'm talking about major movements of the Holy Spirit within families. Uh, families that are reunited. Uh, people who are struggling with their faith, which is a good thing. People who are struggling with their faith and, and wanting to have answers. And they, they can feel the hand of God in their lives. This is happening at your church. This is happening in our church, folks. God is moving. And I want to thank you because you provide the place for people to come. You provide the ministries that we can reach out to folks and bring them into the family of God. That we, we provide a place that can come and be in Sunday school and Bible study. And they can learn about God. And God can, can work on them. And so the, the movement of, of the Holy Spirit, we praise God for that. But I want to thank you for that. Because you provide the place. I just simply ask that you will continue to provide the place. That you will continue to worship God through your giving. Because you understand that lives are being transformed. Because we are faithful in our giving. And God, God blesses that faithful giving. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the things you are doing at this church. We thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, we just we want to be that place where people can come and they know that they will receive hope here. They will come and they will receive forgiveness here. They will receive love here. And so, Lord, let our giving show that, that we understand that we're going to give because we know you're going to use it to reach the lost of this community and the lost of this world. Holy and precious name I pray. Amen. series today, Seven Last Words, uh, we're in the fourth week of this seven-week series, and, and I pray that you're, you're gaining a, a greater understanding as we move through this series, you're, you're gaining a greater understanding of, of who Jesus is and how much he absolutely loves you. In week one, we talked about forgiveness, with the word of Father, forgive them if they don't know what they're doing, Right? Excuse me. And in week two, we talk about salvation, how uh, he looked at the criminals, and today you'll be with me in paradise. 
And last week we talked about being the church family. Just Jesus redefining what family is when he looked at Mary and said, Behold your son, and said, Behold your, 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 your mother. Well, this week we're, we're going to discuss one of the most challenging passages in, in all the Bible. Martin Luther, not Martin King Jr., but Martin Luther, uh, a leader during the Protestant Reformation, once spent an entire day alone in his study, focused solely on this passage. All day long, he, he spent his, all his energy focused on the one passage that we're going to talk about today. Before I get to his conclusion, let us first uh, read the passage. It comes from Matthew 27. Verses 45 through 49. Matthew 27, 45 through 49. It says this, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And God was hearing and the acting upon his holy word. So Martin Luther spent all day alone in his study one day wrestling with this uh, saying of Jesus. My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? All day, he just wrestled. You want to know what his conclusion was? At the end of the day, he stood up and said, God forsaken of God. Who can understand this? He spent all day wrestling with that passage. He finally stood up and he basically said, it is what it is, and that's the best that I can do. So the good news for you today is this sermon is very short. It is what it is. Have a great day. I <laughs> don't oh, wish. Uh, but I want to be very honest with you this morning. It's a difficult passage. Why? Well, because we believe that Jesus was fully human and fully God. Not half God, half human, but fully human and fully God. God. I, brought, I brought an example to give you an idea of this. If you look up here, you'll see these three glasses. Now, this is not the greatest analogy in the world, but it gives you a decent understanding. This glass, both these glasses are full of water. Not sparkling water, but full of water. Uh, if this is God, this is human. All right? Fully God, fully human. So to understand Jesus, we would have to be able to take fully human and fully God, and we would have to be able to pour it into the same size cup and hold both of those cups of water. Now, I can't do that. It's physically impossible. But that is who Jesus is. He's fully human and fully God all in one. Okay? Does that give you a better understanding? It's not half and half. It's not taking half of God, half of human. It's all human and all God in one. Alright? So it's not like uh, he, he, his, his human half is wrestling with his, with his, uh, with his godly half. So how, how does God then forsake God? I mean, is Jesus saying that he abandoned himself? Is Jesus feeling that, that God the Father has abandoned him? Has, is Jesus saying that God the Father has turned his back on him? I mean, how does it make sense? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me if Jesus is fully God? Now, you might not have ever read that like that, but that's really what the, the, the struggle is. Jesus is fully God and fully human. So how can Jesus be at the cross and say, my God, my God? Why have you forsaken me? It doesn't make sense. Now, I'm not saying that I'm smarter than Martin Luther or many other theologians. But there have been other theologians since Martin Luther wrestled with this passage. And so I think I have an understanding of what Jesus was saying. 
But see, for me, just the fact that, that this is recorded by Matthew is pretty amazing to me. The fact that Matthew even puts this in his gospel is pretty amazing. You see, everything else that Jesus says on the cross, everything we've talked about, everything we're going to talk about, that we'll get to in the coming weeks, everything that he says and will say, it makes sense to us. Father, forgive them. We understand that. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your, your mother. We, we, we can wrap our minds around that. But this one is a little different. You know, a cursory read of this passage could be very confusing. And I know that it's confused some of you based on conversations I've had with some of you. Now, I don't want to speak for Matthew, but if I was writing this gospel, I have to be honest, if I was writing this, this gospel, I would have wrestled with even putting this in there. Because I would imagine that people would read it and come to this conclusion that Jesus simply was not who he said he was. You know, Jesus claimed to be the, the Messiah, the Son of God, and yet here he is saying that God had forsaken them, forsaken them. He must not have been who he said he was. But see, I find the fact that Matthew included this as encouraging. You know, the Gospels that we have in the Bible are a warts and all Gospel. Now, some of the warts are difficult to see uh, for us as we don't live during those times and in that culture. But th some things in the Gospels are, are, are very unflattering. Towards Christianity. For example, who were the first people to discover the empty tomb? Women, right? Who were the, who were the people spreading the message that Jesus had been resurrected? Women. That you might not find that interesting, but to the people in that day, it would have meant something completely different. There were people who, who, who didn't believe Jesus was alive simply because it was women saying it. Because women are hysterical. Women can't be trusted. Now, I would never say anything like that. Uh, there's too many women here this morning. But, uh, uh, but when, that's how women were seen back then. They were not seen as equals. But because it was the truth, because of that, that's how it, it, it happened, it is, it is then recorded in the Bible. It would have been much easier just to say that, uh, that the men were the ones saying it. It would have been easier to spread the good news if it was men doing it, if it, they said it was men who discovered the empty tomb, but it wasn't. It wasn't the truth. The fact that it's recorded in the Bible, the way it actually happened, whether you like it or not, adds some validity to the story. The same is true for this word of Jesus. The fact that Matthew records it adds great validity to the story. It is what it is. Jesus said it, and therefore it's in the Bible. What does it mean? If Jesus is fully God, then how does he for, forsake himself? The answer is he doesn't. Okay? He doesn't forsake himself. So then how would Jesus feel abandoned by God? How would Jesus feel, feel forsaken by God? How, why would Jesus feel separated from God? To answer those questions, we must understand the point of Jesus being on the cross. What is the purpose of Jesus' crucifixion? For the Romans, it was death. The people had called for Jesus' death, and the Romans were more than happy to oblige. But for us, what was the purpose of the crucifixion? Now we're told it, it's for our sins, right? We understand that. He, he was crucified for our sins. He took our sins upon himself. And he was crucified for our transgressions. So was it symbolic? No. It was not symbolic. Jesus took our sins upon himself. But what is sin? And what are the results of sin? We need to understand that to understand what Jesus is saying here on the cross. If you look at Amos chapter 3, verse 3, it says this, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? 
You see, sin is what divides us from God. We cannot walk with God unless we agree to do so, unless we agree to give up our sinful nature. Isaiah 59, 1 through 2 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Hear that? Your iniquities have separated uh, us from God. Now if I say, my sin separates me from God, does that sound a little bit like what Jesus is saying on the cross? My God, my God, why have you ab abandoned me? Why have you separated yourself from me? You see, God's desire is to be in every aspect of our lives. He desires to be, in, to be present in all that we do. What He cannot be present in is our sin. Habakkuk uh, one thirteen says, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. You know, too often I hear people say that they feel distant from God. And they ask a very similar question. Why has God left me? Why has God abandoned me? But the question that we need to be asking is, what have I done to remove myself from the presence of God? What have I done to create a separation between me and God? Which brings us back to Jesus' words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is without sin. Right? We understand that Jesus is the only one who has never sinned. Therefore, there could be no separation between God in the flesh and God the Father. Right? Because he's never sinned. So what drew those words out of Jesus? Why did Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the fact is, he took upon himself our sin. Not that he sinned, but he felt the impact of sin. He did not sin, but he felt the, the, the division that sin creates between man and God, and it overwhelmed him. The effects of sin felt by our Savior overwhelmed him. He felt abandoned, forgotten, forsaken, and he cried out. Folks, separation from God is horrific. See, we were created to live in His presence. Most of us have spent time in our life, either a little or a lot, and we've spent time in our lives searching for the answer. You know what the answer is? Searching for the answer. You know, we've got this hole in our heart, this spot in our soul that is longing for something. We don't know what it is, and we just try to fill it up with all this other stuff. Maybe sex will work. Maybe drugs or alcohol will work. Maybe if I just work a lot, maybe I just pour myself into work, it will fill that hole that I, I feel inside of me. It's just a desperate attempt to find the answer to life. That feeling of hopelessness. Figure out what that is. Well, that hopelessness that we feel is our soul crying out for a close relationship with its creator. You ever been separated from your parents? In fact, when you were a kid. You ever get separated from your parents? From your mom and dad when you're out shopping? Do you, do you remember the feeling when you realized you were separated from your parents? I remember when my parents left me at church twice. Um, it was an accident. Um, I don't believe it. Um, but I went through many emotions at that time. And one of the two of the main emotions I felt was, was sadness and anxiety. Because I wasn't where I was supposed to be, and it hurt. And I called out. I got on the phone and I said, Where are you? Hey, who is this? Uh, but, uh, but I wasn't where I was supposed to be, and it hurt me. And we're not where we're supposed to be, it makes us sad. 
makes us feel hopeless. The same is true for our relationship with God. When we are feeling sad, anxious, hopeless, lonely, we need to ask ourselves, have we run to God? Or are we separated from Him? Are we in His presence? Are we living the dream, uh, His dream for our lives? Or are we merely allowing Him to be a small part of our lives? We need to be honest with ourselves. We need to acknowledge the feelings that we have inside toward God. If I took a poll today and asked you what your favorite book of the Bible is, many of you would probably would say Psalms. The book of Psalms. One, because most people know that that's a book of the Bible. But two, that it's, just, it's made up of some lovely poetry. Okay, It's made up of some beautiful imagery. But if you've never read the book of Psalms, you might not understand. There's a darker side to that book. There are some psalms that, if, that when we read them, we wonder, should, should those words be uttered towards God? I mean, should that really, should, should, should the David, the psalmist, really be writing that down? I mean, if you listen to Psalm 88, it says, But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I've suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and, and am in, in, in despair. Your wrath has, has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. And then Psalm 10 begins with, Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourselves? Yourself in times of trouble. Separation. Separation. Now I want you to listen to the beginning of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. Does it sound familiar to you this morning? I don't mean because Jesus uttered the same words on the cross, but do those words sound familiar because those words have been on your heart at some point? God, why are you forsaking me? God, why have you abandoned me? Why? Where are you? 16th century poet John of the Cross called it the dark night of the soul. There is a great description. Those times when we feel completely abandoned by God. Folks, I want you to hear something this morning that you may not have heard in church before. Life is ugly. Life's ugly. David, who the Bible tells us was a man after God's own heart, experienced the ugliness of life. So much so that he wrote things in the book of Psalms that address the very real pain that we feel in life. But often we are uncomfortable in getting in touch with that kind of pain. Or we think as Christians, we shouldn't feel that type of pain. Right? But we're Christians. We shouldn't feel that. We're guilty of it. As long as we sweep it under the rug, I'm to ignore it. Jesus Christ Himself cried out on the cross the way David cried out, "My God, My God, why have You forsaken me?" Jesus cried out because He experienced separation, anxiety, and He experienced it because He became sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 begins, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. It is our sin that brought the most horrible torture upon Jesus. The torture of being separated from God. No amount of beings can equal the feeling of being separated from our Creator. 
It was my sin and it was your sin. It was all of our sin that led Jesus to feel the most horrible feeling known to man. The feeling of being separated from God. And yet, He did it for us. He did it for you. And He did it for me. Jesus was forsaken. So that we would never have to be forsaken. Hear that. Jesus was forsaken. So that we would never have to be forsaken. It's the fact that Jesus took upon him our transgressions. That we are free from our transgressions. Forgiveness is available. The chasm that is created between us and God when we sin can be overcome by accepting the sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. The crucifixion of Jesus is the crucifixion of our sin. Because of Jesus' death, forgiveness is available. A bridge has been built. That was Jesus' mission. His purpose. To reconcile us with God. To be the atonement for our sins. That's why His body was broken. That's why His blood was shed. So that we could have forgiveness. The song I sing in a moment opens with the line, I'm forgiven. You are forsaken. You hear the second half of 2 Corinthians 5 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But you can choose to ignore the feelings you're having, or you can cry out this morning. You can choose to, to, to think that, well, I can't express these emotions. Not, it's not to God. But I mean, I just, it's not, it's not, it's not proper. So I just need to bury it. I'll get over it sometime. You, you can choose to do that. Or you can pour it out to them. You can cry out. I, I told some of you, and I won't say exactly from the pulpit what I'm talking about, but I have stood in the classroom and I have poured out my anguish and my hatred and my, and my hurt to God in ways that I, I'm ashamed to admit. But I had to get it out. God's a big God. God's a big God. And He can take it. But you can, you can, you can choose to ignore it. You can push it down. You can choose to ignore that separation between you and God this morning. Or you can cry out and tell God all about the ugly things in your life. The stuff that no one else knows about. The pain, the hurt, the anger that you're feeling today. Do you need forgiveness for your sins today? Are you separate from God due to your transgressions? Know this, know today that Jesus took your, your sin upon himself and he's created hope and he's created the assurance of forgiveness just for you. We'll be sharing the Lord's Supper in a moment. The bread you're about to eat and the juice you're about to drink reminds us of the work done on the cross. The blood shed by Jesus washes our sin white as snow. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried that out so that you would never have. Forgiveness is available. A 
closer relationship with the Creator is available. Hope is available. Assurance is available. Is there separation separation between you and God this morning? Do you want to fix it? Like I said, I'm all going to share in communion. And as you come, I simply want to invite you to take the bread, to go dip it in the cup. And I'm going to simply invite you to, to kneel here at the front, or still in the front row if you can't kneel. And I just want to invite you to pray. This is not an official altar call or anything like that, but just take the, take the opportunity you have right now to just be in prayer. Do you need forgiveness? Did you do something this week that you need to ask forgiveness for? Are you angry at something? Do you need to pour that out this morning? Do you feel separated from God? Do you look around at everyone else in this church and think, they've got it, they've figured it out, but I'm just, I'm lost. Do you feel separated from God? Do you fix it? The blood and the body have been shed. So we can come know you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm humbled this morning that it was on my behalf that you took upon yourself my sin. And Lord, I, I am ashamed to know that it was my sin that made you feel separated from God the Father. But I am so thankful that you experienced that for me. I'm so thankful that you were willing to take that upon you. Even though it overwhelmed you, you were willing. And because you were willing, I can come before you and kneel down and have forgiveness poured out of me. So I just thank you for that. Lord, I just pray for this congregation and myself that we would not squander this opportunity. That if there is some separation between you and us, that we would, we would come forward and we would just kneel down here at the altar of the front row or where we sit, you know, and we would just cry out to you. Lay it all out for you. Every feeling we've got, every doubt that we have, whatever the case may be, that we would just be completely honest with you today. Lord, if there's someone here who, who just doesn't believe in you, they would just say, God, I don't believe in you this morning. That they would be honest with you. They would open up with you today. No one has to hear what's in their minds. And so free them to be honest and open with you this morning. And Lord, I just pray that as they open up and the Holy Spirit would move and would touch their hearts. That they would be given some assurance that yes, you are here. And yes, you do love me. And yes, there is hope for reconciliation. Lord, we thank you that on the night that you were betrayed, you could gather with your disciples. And you explain to them what was about to take place. We're thankful that you took the, 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 the cup and you said, this is my, this is my blood. And you took the bread and said, this is my blood broken and poured out for you. Broken. Tortured. Flung. Nailed to a cross. All of us. Let us understand the importance of what we're about to do. Let us focus on you.
And the Father, I just pray that that became clear. That we understood what we were doing. That we understood the, the, the impact. We understand your, your, your sacrifice. So Lord, I just pray that, uh, that for those here this morning that, that cried out to you, that they that you would go with them throughout this week. And they can proclaim that I am forgiven because my Jesus was forsaken. And they can stand proud. And they would go from here spreading the good news. That it's okay when you feel angry inside. It's okay when you feel just 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 uh, you know hurt and resentment. That's okay because life is ugly. Life's gonna get you down. But because Jesus hung on the cross, we need to be able to go to him and say, hey, this is what I feel. And I understand you've not forsaken me, but I've turned my back on you. And so let us continue to surrender to you throughout this week. Let us continue to come to you and lay down your fears. Because because you are for sin, we can be forgiven. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and proclaim these words this morning.
that seems to me we can't honor him unless we're close to him. Unless we're in fellowship with him, we can't honor him. So I hope that you will grow in your relationship after today. We are going to take a moment today to honor him. And it's a way that I wish we didn't have to do. But sometimes you know, I said life's ugly, and sometimes things happen in our lives that we don't really like, we don't want, we don't want for our loved ones. We get a call from a doctor, and it's bad news. And so I'm looking at the clock, and I see that it's 12.15. Uh, so we run a little long today, and I know that we might have other stuff we need to do today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to offer a, a benediction. And I'm going to invite Melinda Kirby, Vernon Kirby, down to the front here. Many of y'all know Melinda. Melinda's been a uh, huge part of this church for a long time. If it wasn't for her, we would have never had a children's ministry. I mean, she, she took that on herself. Did a great job with that. And they are devoted to this church. They've done so much for this church. Their kids are wonderful. Um, Team, it's team, but they're one of the kids. <laughs> Melinda's not been feeling well lately. She's been worn down, tired, by herself. You know, Melinda, you know she's, woo! You know, it's full of energy. She's not been that way lately. So she wanted to get some tests done. Renal cancer.
preaching and living the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel that says, I've been forsaken on your behalf. Forgiveness and healing and hope is available. So go. Go in his name. Amen. If you want to stay, please hang out. Linda and Bernie might you come down. We get uh, Tina and